بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد خاتم الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحابته أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome and thank you for for being patient for um, the initial um, glitches I think we're not able to um, go live on the on the other um, platform so I've been asked to just start off with the Facebook live um, I've never used Facebook and um, this is the first time I've gone live on Facebook, so um, I'm coming to this session doing something I normally don't do. Um, but I'll be getting texts from the um, the moderator um, on this topic, and it's, it's actually a very controversial topic. Um, I was in two minds whether to actually um, proceed with the discussion at all, um, because it's about um, nationalism. I understand it's about um, um, about identity as well and, and I was told that there's a lot of problems amongst the Muslim community about identity and so um, I obviously do know that fact um, it's a very contentious issue and it's a very topical issue because even if you look at your um, at your news feed you'll find a lot of the the items of news that you consume as, as human beings and whether you're Muslim or not Muslim they are actually related to identity and vis-a-vis -vis Muslims specifically, there's a lot of discussions about Muslims and, and their allegiance to the countries within which they live. Specifically, um, if you think about um, Europe uh, and, and the rise of the far right, a number of political parties in Denmark, in, 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 um, in, in, in Holland, in, in Germany, France. And in fact, there's very few countries that you could actually um, say that there's not a rise in the far right. And one of the, one of the main clarion calls of those um, parties is the perceived uh, inability of Muslims to assimilate or even to swear allegiance in, in, in a meaningful way to the state within which they live. But it's also important to kind of have uh, an, a look at the, the immediate backdrop. Uh, so part of it is to do with the um, kind of political situation and obviously it ties into this issue of Islamophobia and Muslims are constantly charged with this idea that they're not assimilating but also with the fact that they and promote a specific type of allegiance which is intranational, in other words, it's beyond nation states, it's, it's to, to this ummah. And in fact, I, 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 was, I was in England um, just um, a couple of, last month in fact, and I was discussing with one of my colleagues there about the fact that the word ummah itself, um, the government is trying to, you know, get Muslims to stop using the word, which is such an emotive word, but it's also essential to our religious tradition as well. So even the idea of the Ummah, which is what usually Muslims aspire to being part of, uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very clearly says, indeed this, this community of yours is Ummatan Wahida, is one unified uh, whole. Muslims believe that to be very, very close to their hearts, and it's very difficult for them to articulate things about identity. If the vocabulary within which they, 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 they frame their discussions is being taken away from them. So we have to be very careful uh, in terms of um, not capitulating to pressures from outside, from government uh, and from public bodies. But part of, part of the discussion actually is about also taking ownership of this discussion as well. So, you know, we have discussion about the far right, we have the Brexit issue a couple of days ago, um, Britain triggered Article 50, as you, as you well know. Um, you also have um, the discussion about the Khilafah as well, because that is, that is the, the, the end result of the question of identity, because as a Muslim, it remains unsaid, but Muslims do have this this desire to live uh, under the purview of Islamic law. Uh, and, but the, the problem always is about what that actually means. Um, so, I mean, the discussion is topical. Everybody um, in some way interacts with the discussion. And also, I remember a couple of decades ago when I was starting out studying, there was a whole discussion about hijrah as well, but emigrating from one country to another country. And there was from this country, which is considered to be a non-Muslim country, and then going out to, um, you know, going out to a country which is perceived to be more Muslim and more Islamic. And obviously, a lot of times when people left and went to these countries, they found that it wasn't actually the case as well. So we have this idea of hijrah as well. And what's interesting about this idea of hijrah when it came out in, in the 80s and 90s, was it was always tied in with this idea of what takfir as well. So it wasn't just the fact that you're going to a Muslim country or to live a Muslim life, as the, as the saying goes, but also within it was this idea that you were actually disassociating yourself with other people. 
Uh, and and that, that movement, actually, if you, if you think about it, started in Egypt in, in the 60s. There was, a, there was actually an organization there called Jama'at Takfir wal Hijar. It was a Jama'a, a, a community of, of people that considered some, themselves to be a beyond or apart from normal believers, who did Hijar, but also while doing it, um, displayed this characteristic of Takfir, which was to excommunicate other Muslims as well. And that was this idea that we don't belong to Egyptian society, it's corrupt, it's pharaonic, in fact. It's, it's full of disbelief and polytheism and, and jahiliya, as, as the term goes. And they were trying to go into a state of purity as well. So the discussion here in Scotland is actually, just to give you an insight in, in, in what's happening in Scotland and why um, maybe I've got a different perspective in discussion, was discussing this topic, is that the sense of identity that Muslims have in, in Scotland to, to Scotland itself is, is completely different, I've found, in terms of um, travelling to the, the perception of Muslims living in England um, to their own... Um, home residence, which is England itself. Uh, and it's interesting because nationalism usually is seen to be kind of count, a counterpoint to religious um, you know, religious um, affiliation as well. So those are the kind of immediate things that we think about. We think about takfir, we think about uh, hijrah, we think about the rise of the, the, the far right. But also, I, I think um, sociologically as well, we have bottlenecks in terms of social mobility for Muslims as well, which is which cannot be denied anymore. I mean, the, the fact that if you're if you're a Muslim and you go to a, a, if you forward your CV for for a job application, uh, it's statistically shown to be very clearly um, something that that goes against you if you've got a clearly Muslim name. So the same person, the same CV, a different name, um, they put, both put forward their their job applications. The tendency is that the person with a non-Muslim name will generally get beyond the initial stage of of recruitment. Why is that important to this discussion? It's this idea that if you don't feel you belong as a social um, factor, you don't believe that you're, you're part and parcel of in the fabric of uh, part of a fabric of a society, you'll end up dissipating and feeling that your allegiances are not uh, here and this is not your home. And the important thing about um, feeling at home is the fact that Ibn Khaldun, the great uh, Muslim sociologist, in fact, considers to be the father of sociology, he considered this 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 quality of asabiya or this quality of of being connected to a, a, a wider meaning to be very core to being a human being, and so we talk about uh, human beings being um, the social animals. So they 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 have to socialize. And one of the key concepts of um, Ibn Khaldun was actually this concept of umran, uh, which is actually to civilize and to and to live us and to create civilization, uh, and. And that, in fact, if a human being feels that they cannot fulfill that um, process within a country, so a Muslim listening to this uh, feels that they cannot make this their home and they cannot build civilization here in Britain, in England or in Scotland or in Wales, um, then they, they will feel that they're looking elsewhere to build that civilization. And that really, for me, comes to the, to the crux of this whole discussion about um, identity about about feeling an affinity to a specific place is that you only feel an affinity to a specific place if you feel that you can build something there for yourself, but probably more importantly for your family and for your offspring that you have a state of um, you know you have a state of um, you know safety and that safety will allow you then to plan for the future and invest in in the social structures and in the civic structures that you have here. So you have that immediate discussion. The immediate discussion is one of politics, uh, of, of the day-to-day -day politics that we see. But there's also a secondary aspect which I want to just touch, touch upon before we go into the in immediate questions, um, which is a kind of the, the, the kind of whole idea of nationalism in, in general, and in fact even internationalism. So you always have this kind of, you know, when I was studying university, one of the things we did to do was politics and geopolitics. And you had this kind of idea that, you know, in, in the 60s, um, early 60s, there was this idea that nationalism would, would, would peter out because people would start to assimilate, nation states would come together, you would have things like the European Union, uh, which would be kind of umbrella organisations which would then, you know, kind of move aside all the kind of cultural differences that people have and kind of unify them on, on general principles. The interesting thing is that's not happened. Uh, and also the other aspect to nationalism, which was internationalism, which is basically the Russian 
um, project of communism and Marxism. That was also considered to be one of the ways of combating capitalism. Both of these were considered to be, uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein actually says these were considered to be, nationalism internationals were a reaction to capitalism and, and this growth of capital accumulation amongst individuals and landed elites. Um, these two things, internationalism has, has disappeared, but what's happened is a rise in nationalism, and you'll see Brexit is a perfect example of that. And within that, Muslims feel alienated, and that is really at the crux of it. So this idea of looking for identity now for Muslims is a big question. But just take yourself back to uh, the fall of the Khilafah, or even before that, during the, the, the colonial period, you had Muslims writing about the same thing in the Muslim world, about the sense of alienation from their own um, history in their own countries, like Morocco, in, in, in Syria, in Iran, in Pakistan, before the partition of the subcontinent, um, Shaul al-Dihlawi, for example, they felt this idea of alienation and they wanted to um, recreate something that was um, a better state of affairs for themselves. So even when a lot of Muslims, when I talk to them about identity and, and, and feeling a sense of belonging in this country, I always remind them that there was always this sense of alienation amongst Muslims wherever they were, whether it was in the middle of the Muslim world or whether it was in, you know, a minority situation um, like we find ourselves here. So it's always a very tempting for, for Muslims to feel that the grass is greener on the other side, to feel that, you know, everything will become better if we do the hijrah, we do the emigration to a Muslim country, and that will, you know, alleviate all the problems that we have. The reality is, wherever you go, you have to feel um, a, a stakeholder in this process of Imran, this process of building civilization. So you, you invest your energy, you you gain employment, and you try and better society. And that is the way that you create your identity. It's a shared identity. And, and the questions probably will be about, you know, to do, what degree can we share identity with, with, with um, people that we don't share a religion with? with? And obviously, you know, I'm going to try and argue that that is, you know, that's a skewed understanding of our Islamic tradition. It, it shows a lack of understanding of usul al-fiqh, uh, of also Islamic history, early Islamic history as well. Um, so it's important just to focus for a moment on the idea of feeling a, a sense of belonging. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he created him as, 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 a, as, a, as, a, as a member of the Qurayshi um, society, integral part of the Qurayshi society. He was al amin the well-known one. And in fact, his, his heart was in the city to the point that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he received revelation, he went to Warqa ibn Nawfal and Warqa ibn Nawfal famously prophesied that they will, they're going to throw you out of the city. And the Prophet said, are they, going to have the, are they going to throw me out of this city, which I love? And he was petrified by the fact that we'd have to leave, he'd have to leave the city that he felt affinity to, that he, he was born in, that he felt was, you know, the place that he wanted to, you know, create his own um, family hub. That was, that was shocking for the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam. And when he leaves, in fact, another thing about having this affinity to a land and feeling this, this quality of wanting to build is when the Prophet was, was being forced out, he said, you know, he turned to Mecca to Al-Mukarramah and in the most metaphorical ways, he said, you're the most beloved of, of, of habitations to me. And if it wasn't for my people um, throwing me out of this city, I would never have left you. So he leaves to Madinat al Nawara. And what he does in Madinat Nawara is actually the perfect example of a person being able to re-establish this impetus to recreate civilization and to create this quality of Imran and to really invest in a, in a group of people. And that was how, that was when the Prophet ﷺ, he said, as a famous hadith of Imam Muslim, is that the Prophet ﷺ said, I prayed twice as much for the city of Madinat Nawara than Ibrahim, مِثْلَيْ مَا دَعَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ لِمَكَّةَ I, I prayed from twice as much as Ibrahim Ali Salatu Wasallam prayed for Mecca al Mukarrama. That that was Prophet investing in the city, investing in the people, investing in in the project of establishing something in a place that otherwise was was desolate. It was Yathrib, obviously. You know that the name was Yathrib, which basically means a place which is which is desolate. And he made it into the Madinat al Nawara. He made it into the enlightened city. The enlightenment, as uh, Qadi Ayad radiAllahu anhu says, it was through the people that were there, it wasn't through the buildings, it wasn't through, you know, the infrastructure, it was through the people that had a very specific message. But you know that when the Prophet arrived in the city, what he did 
was he he really became part and parcel of the city. He gave a khutbah in which he said, if shu salam, spread peace, and and give people food. In other words, people that are that are ill. And, and, and pray while people are asleep. You'll enter paradise by, with ease. But then he set about creating that society. And for us, listening to this very specific narration of the Prophet I'm coming to the city of Medina Nawala, we have to think, um, you know, the Prophet could have easily have said there was people in the city uh, who were actually, the moment he arrived in the city, were actually agitating against him. They were openly trying to undermine his existence there, even as you have the EDL um, trying to, you know, kind of stoke up anger against Muslims. You have that same situation. And, and would the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasallam in this context, and this is a question, rhetorical, I think it's a rhetorical question, would he have given up and said, well, I need to go somewhere back to where we were accepted and we feel at home and there's no kind of dis difficulty? No, he felt that he had to show the sunnah, which is that in certain situations you have to you have to really go beyond in terms of sacrificing your own your own securities and your own um, ease for the common good and investing to the point that then the society changes and that's what the prophet one of the great meanings of the prophet's message was that he was the one that the prophet that changed the people he changed people's hearts he changed people's perceptions he changed the way people looked at the world and that was be, from enemies to friends, he, he was able to turn people. And one of the problems I find in modern Muslim discourse in Britain is this kind of resignation to the fact that we cannot uh, attempt or we will not attempt to do that in this, in this, in this country, in this society. That we, re we resign ourselves to being um, second class citizens, we resign ourselves to being a fifth column, we resign ourselves to, to, to shouting from the, from the, from the, the sidelines. In terms of becoming people that have this kind of tendency towards, um, you know, conspiracy theory. Muslims are, you know, always, you'll find that conspiracy theories are given a lot of uh, mileage in Muslim discourse. Because of the fact that you don't feel that you can engage in, in the actual discussions that are ha happening at the time. So, the Prophet has invested, he created a place of worship, but he also created a marketplace. So, you always mentioned the Prophet created a mosque and how it was created with the, 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 the camel qaswa. But we never think, what did the Prophet also do? He created a market, a free market, where people could buy and sell, so he created prosperity. Uh, he created an end to monopoly, monopolistic practices in the marketplace. He also created the first written constitution, and the first written constitution was actually uh, one that was shared between people that, from the Aus and Khazra entered Islam, and that, those that had not. The Jewish tribes, four or five of the Jewish tribes that were around Medina Nawara and within the city itself, and also people that had not entered into faith, so, and the Muhajirun and the Ansar, it was a mix of people. It was a cosmopolitan uh, constitution where there was absolute equality, and this is a historical document, and it's a historical moment where human society writes down in a specific place where you have desperate types of people, you have all types of people, there is no sense of differentiation at that moment in time. And all of these things point me towards the fact that we need to start to, to, to kind of create a wider narrative about what we are doing in this society. So those are just kind of general pointers that I wanted to, to touch upon. Um, because it's, it's a big issue, it's, it, 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 I mean, you can be pulled up about this. And everybody is waiting in this kind of topic to say, well, you're... You're a sellout, or you're an extremist, or I think Muslims have to have the confidence to be able to discuss and engage without having this fear of what does that mean for people. They have to have the confidence to be able to engage in those discussions. If you don't have the confidence, you should just put your put your put your boots up and just um, you know go to the the caves. Um, because at the end of the day, people will criticise, people will argue, but I think the most important thing is to actually have a, a very clear a very frank discussion about these topics. So I'll go into the questions actually I was sent. These questions are being sent to me by text by the moderator. Uh, how can Muslims understand nationalism in light of controversial foreign policy? Very good point, but I think there's two kind of strands here. How do you understand nationalism? Nationalism has got a very bad press in the Muslim um, community. Um, in, in a sense, in modern Muslim discourse, there's this idea that nationalism is antagonistic to faith. Um, Look, nationalism is nothing more than 
a sense of identity that came into being at the point that you create very distinct nation states. And um, that's a modern concept. So, so um, when you think about um, when you think about um, nationalism itself, remember the nation state itself is actually a very um, modern um, concept, so 100 years old, for example, you know, roughly about 100 years old. And because of that, we can't say that, well, the Prophet condemned nationalism. He condemned something called Asabiya. Asabiya was this rampant um, pre Islamic tendency to boast about your lineage, to boast about your, your tribal allegiances. And the Prophet rightly and, and incessantly, and there's many actual hadith where the Prophet said, whoever fights for Asabiya. Or, or, or kills for Asabiya is not from us. So it's very clear, no, numerous hadith. And there's also a hadith, a very interesting hadith in Sahih Muslim in the Prophet. Or in fact, Awe ibn Ka'ab said a person who was, was said to a person who was who was boasting about his tribal lineage and as if he was better than everybody else. He said a very um, a crude, very crude statement and he and he claimed that the Prophet had given him authority to do that. So Asabiya is something that is, is there. It's not the same as nationalism. Um, because all of, all that nationalism is is this tendency to create this border and then say we're going to try and make sure in in a kind of statutory way or in a kind of legislative way or in a kind of in, in an administrative way to focus on this piece of land and um, to create our civilization in a way that's manageable in a way that we have shared cultural sensibilities that we have shared language. Um, and, and there's nothing specifically wrong with that because the Prophet said him, he he did he didn't come to negate national identity he didn't come to negate um, the identity of specific cultures which is probably what we could discern is, is the closest to nationalism at the time of the Prophet said him. so the Prophet wore clothes that were from Abyssinia from Yemen he wore clothes that were from you know a Rome he wrote, he wore clothes that were from Egypt. Without and that was an amazing thing to do. I mean, the Prophet actually just what he did was he he embraced he embraced cultures. He embraced as a prophet, which is a, such an amazing thing. Think about it. He's living in the seventh century, you know, Christian era in, in Arabia, and he is embracing people from um, Bilal al Habashi, Shuhayb al Rumi. He's embracing Salman al Farisi. He's embracing people and he's making them part. In fact, he said, he said about Salman al Farisi. Salman min ahl al bayt. He is from us, from the ahl al bayt. Now, there's no greater way of commending anybody than to to, to see that actually happening. So, the Prophet had uh, an amazing ability to congregate different cultures, but he was international, or he was beyond culture in terms of the outlook. He was, as we say, rahmatan lil alamin. He was a mercy to all of humanity. He crossed the borders, but he never negated uh, identity in terms of of cultural identity. In fact, it comes from the fact that the Quran, um, you know, very specifically mentions that there is, um, you know, within the process of having um, tribes and nations and, and tongues, uh, so that you know one another, is not negating that. It's just saying that these are ident these are the identity markers. So we have to start to, uh, you know, I, I think in terms of nationalism. How can Muslims understand nationalism? in light of controversial foreign policy. It's as if the question is saying nationalism is the force by which a specific nation involves itself in aggression. So I'm, I'm, that's what I'm understanding from it. And in a sense, if you were to unpack that slightly more, you would probably say um, a specific nation, you, say, you can say America, you can say the UK, you can say you know, any you know, kind of colonialist power in the past engages in that because of its self-interest. And that's absolutely true. I mean, there's no, um, there's no hiding the fact that um, the Western countries in general have had a, a torrid um, press in terms of their foreign policy and their colonial history. And that's to be expected due to the history of their, of their nation building. And from the 17th century all the way up till the end of the Second World War, there's been a very aggressive... Um, Move to carve up the rest of the world, not just the Muslim world, but all the rest of the world as well. Um, and there's no shortage of stories that show the abhorrence of their actions in that situation. Look at the French in Algeria uh, before in the set during the time of the Second World War, just after the Second World War. I mean, that was in, in colonialism at its worst, and even to this day, the the the, the way that they control um, a certain countries that had an affiliation historically is nothing short of 
um, you know, scandalous, you know, so. But I think what the issue here is about in, in terms of foreign policy, we have to look at each action on its merits. And it's not just the fact that you tie in aggression upon the fact that it's a nation based upon it being nationalistic, doing it, and that's the reason for it. So I think nationalism, because you have nation states, it's natural that only nation states will engage in war, only nation states will engage in controversial foreign policy, but then again, only nation states will engage in non-controversial foreign policy as well. So it's, it, it's, it's almost a logical non sequitur to say it's nationalism that's doing it. So you have many nations that are known for the, the, their role in terms of bridge, bridge building, and you have many nations that have the complete opposite in perception in, in international circles as well. So I think foreign, controversial foreign policy, um, I'll probably touch on that in a moment because I think the question seems to be couch, it seems to be specifically about um, stating that nationally is, 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 the, is the source of controversial foreign policy. And I think um, that does not um, stand up to scrutiny because of the simple fact that nation states are the way that, that countries are or cultures are, are organised at this time. Um, the next, next question is, do Muslims have to let go of their cultural heritage in order to assimilate into British culture? That's a very good question because it, it touches upon identity. And identity is very clearly related to what you eat, what you wear, um, you know, how you speak, uh, what you hold to be dear. In a sense, your values, I think. I mean, this, there's a whole move, you probably know about this, there's a whole move to have British values. And I'm living in Scotland thinking there's Scottish values as well. Those values are actually, if you talk to our great tradition of Muslim scholars like Ibn Ashur, for example, he, in his book, in his great uh, work on Maqasid, on, on the philosophy of Islamic law, he talks about the fact that uh, human societies are built upon this understanding that at the core of, of a society is this concept of fitra. Fitra is this natural disposition. And what he says is that natural disposition, disposition is actually something that's shared within all societies. And then he says that, and he's quoting Ibn Atiyah, he says that that indicates that all human societies have at their core, core the same core values. And you'll know what those are. It's basically the defense of and projection, protection of intellect, of lineage, of wealth, of, of, of safety of life, um, of religion as well. And it was freedom of freedom to believe. Those, he says, are actually integral to all societies. And in that sense, if you're saying that how can you assimilate into British culture? There's elements of British culture that actually Brit the Brit Brits themselves know are detrimental to human society. So, you know, you have this pub culture and they always complain about the fact that the a &E wards are full up and if some of the students are um, medical practitioners, they'll know, you know, the, wh how, how the Saturday and Sunday works, the Friday, Saturday and Sunday um, shift is because of the fact so many people come in. They understand that this is detrimental. They understand that you know, free mixing and, and extramarital relations lead to, you know, on, on the face of it, lead to ex extreme um, social, um, you know, kind of upheavals within societies. But is this taken to be part and parcel of um, how humans are because they want to live in that specific way? In our situation, there's nothing that stops us, us having our own cultural heritage, which, which hones in uh, certain tendencies within British culture, which we, which the Brits themselves will say, look, these are these are not conducive to the public good, and and you can speak to the police, you can speak to um, public servants, and they will admit the same thing. So I think what you have to do is your cultural heritage. Every single country that exports people, they export culture. They come and they give and they take. So basically, culture is something that is is not dictated and prescribed by Islamic law. It's descriptive. It's a descriptive quality that any society has. So Islam does not come to tell you, this is how you have to dress, this is how you have to, uh, this is what you have, kind of food you have to, to have. It tells this is the general guidelines for, for, for clothing, this is the general guidelines for food, and this is the general guidelines for gender interaction as well. And every society will have different tendency. And this is why, um, in the time of the Prophet Islam, in Mecca to Muqarrama, the, the gender relations in a simple, um, in a simple way, were actually different in Mecca and Medina Munawwara, and that's brought in many hadith. But Aisha praised the women of the Ansar because of their specific aptitude to, to question and not feel shy, and also the fact that the Muslim men from um, Mecca to Muqarrama, the Muhajirun, complained and said the women of Medina Munawwara are corrupting our women. 
um, from, from Mecca in, in terms of the, the gender relations that were there were completely different. Um, so obviously cultures are different. Cultures, um, you know, vary greatly in terms of what they bring. What is important is that you don't jettison your cultural identity. You don't jettison the kind of clothes you wear at home or the t language that you speak. It enriches society. But what the question here is, is actually to identify what is it that is essential to British culture which will actually enrich um, the Muslim experience of being here. It doesn't mean to assimilate to the point you lose your identity. It means what is it in this society that we can take and build upon. And you'll find many things. And this is the thing that I, I love to speak to Muslims about is, okay, well, what do you think in this society is there which is um, actually beneficial to Muslims? So what is it? There is, and there's plenty of things. There's this, you know, when I was in, um, I'll just give you a, a story which shows you how, how strange this is. I was in Damascus for a long period of my life. And when I got, came back during a summer vacation, I, I went to the bank. And I got to the bank and I actually pushed my way to the front of the queue. And, and then I realized that actually this is not, Watch, this is not the way it works. I've been away for a good 15 years in uh, this country. And, and, and there's such a thing as a queue. Because I was used to in Damascus stand, standing in a bread queue and actually the, there was no queue. It was just a, it was like a, if you've ever played rugby, I played rugby. So you have a kind of, you know, scrum and everybody was just pushing towards the central, um, you know, kind of window which was selling the, the, the bread. And you had, if you didn't do that, you would just end up three hours later. I tried a couple of times, I thought I'll be patient. And I'll show that kind of British sense of decorum and patience. And it didn't work. I mean, you just went back uh, without lunch. And that, that's, that, that's, that's, that's something that about timekeeping, about order, being orderly, about being a meritocracy as well. I mean, that's something that... I wrote an article, actually, in the Scot I think Scotsman a couple of years ago, meritocracy in, 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 in Ottoman uh, Khilafah. And the way it was built was built upon meritocracy. A person who was a, was a son of a servant could actually become the, the right-hand man of the Khalifa within a generation because they were based upon merit, merit. And that's something that's, that still exists here. You can, based upon your ability to, to provide a service and to excel in your profession, you can actually excel very quickly. The social ladder is actually very accessible to people. But it means that you have to actually um, do the work. And, and is that the same case with Muslim countries? You know, I beg to question people that say that Muslim countries are like that. If you look at the, t the type of racism in Muslim countries, I've lived in, in a number of Muslim countries in the Middle East, if you look at the way that you know people from the Palestinian um, lands are treated as minorities, as immigrants in within these countries, it's nothing short of of disgraceful. Uh, if you look at the way that the subcontinent Muslims are treated in, in Saudi Arabia and the Arab Gulf, it's nothing short of absolutely disgusting. Um, and that is a constant trait. I mean, we cannot hide behind this idea that everything is greener on the other side, and we're going to do hijrah to this to this kind of idyllic. A Muslim country. We have to start to become a bit more pragmatic and we'll have to go in for the long haul and we'll have to really put effort into creating what Ibn Khaldun, as I mentioned before, said is to civilize the earth. One of the purposes that Raghab al-Asfahani says about the reason that you're on the earth is to civilize the earth. It's one of the main reasons to worship God and to civilize the earth. That's why the Khalifa, that's why you are the, the vice of God on earth. So do Muslims have to let go of their cultural heritage in order to assimilate into British culture? They definitely should not touch their culture. They should take the best of it and enrich their life through it because everybody is enriched by their culture. If you have no culture, you have no texture to your life. Um, Prosim never you know, took people's culture away from them. He allowed it to flourish. And definitely don't get rid of it to assimilate into anything. But the thing is to use the cultural heritage of the British the British nation and in Scotland is, is quite natural for Muslims to see that connection and to do that is to meet in the middle and actually remember you, you're, in, you're not the host you are you're here and you're learning about the, the kind of the, 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 the values of this, this country and to understand them is, is the first task and I think one of the, the great um, short, shortcomings of our communities when we arrived in these nations if you're from outside if you're a convert it's different is they've not taken the time to study the language, to study the culture on its own terms, uh, to understand what what the historical development of this country is, 
And also and issues like you know, freedom of speech, for example, a lot of Muslims always go on, on about freedom of speech. The discussion and development of the, the concept of freedom of speech in the West, and specifically in Britain, has a long history which a lot of Muslims don't understand, so they don't understand why it's such an emotive topic for, 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 West, for Westerners and non-Muslims to talk about in such an emotive way, because they don't realise why they had to fight for that specific right. So obviously, that process of coming to terms with where we are naturally is completely um, disabled by the fact that, that you know, externally there's a lot of pressure on Muslims to actually to conform now. And, and then that makes the whole process of naturally coming to terms with an understanding of a culture um, almost something that you can't do. So it's actually very difficult. So we're finding ourselves in a very difficult situation. It does not mean that we do not make that attempt. We still make the attempt to do that. And also, how should Muslims view the non-Muslim British majority? Again, that's a good question. Because within it, there's this idea that, um, you know, can we... You know, to what degree can we can can we um, assimilate? To what degree should we feel part of this society? That is a is a good question, but it's also it's it's indicative of a very strange state that we're in. That we even asking this kind of type of question. If you were to ask the Prophet how would you see that, or how would would you want it? I mean, this is a good way of putting things into perspective. In all situations, that are difficult. As if imagine you're asking that question to the Prophet that would, for me, clarifies over you know twenty years of studying, um, you know, all types of sciences. I'm very clear about what the problem, his perception of that would be. I don't have any kind of ambiguity in my head of the fact that he would say, you know, go to these people, spread peace, open, um, you know, charitable organisations, help the people there that are in need, you know, give, basically give them, and spread the message through giving them. And and also one of the things our te- one of our teachers Habibullah Hafizullah he said to us when we were you know when we were leaving from our studies was to when you went to the he said when you went to, when you go to the West never speak to somebody and think that they're they're less than you or lower than you in, in rank always consider themselves to be higher than you a person that has more of a proximity to God and that's the perception you have to have when you're speaking to somebody else so your perception of these people is the same perception. The Prophet ﷺ had when he was calling uh, Umar radiallahu anhu or saying Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu or Uthman or Amr ibn As or Khalid ibn Walid or when he was calling to them to Islam, his perception of them was not these people, you know, they have they're completely ignorant and you know how dare they attempt to you know deny God's existence. The Prophet ﷺ sat and within seconds he would become he would become close to them in terms of their, his interaction and they would perceive that this person is concerned but concerned about them and that's in fact what the Quran says <laughs> he has he is covetous for them he is he's desirous for their good and he is kind, kind and compassionate with the with, with the believers that is the quality that you have to have that's how you have to perceive you have to perceive the host country as being one that has invited you in if you if you're just arrived or if you're third generation you should not perceive them as anything except except for people that say that share in a civic responsibility to this country to create civilization and it's in everybody's interest to create a strong civilization which protects the the, the, the weak and the vulnerable and creates a very strong structure for your own your own families to grow up in so you're actually in a shared project and one of the big mistakes that Muslims, that Muslims make is that they always perceive people only from the perspective of religious affiliation, which from my reading of Islamic history, from my reading of Islamic um, theology and, and law is, is not correct at all. You look at people from different perspectives and the Prophet did that and he, he enriched people's lives through that process up from the beginning to the end of the Prophet's life. You have the famous hadith of Fudayk radiallahu anhu, who was one of the companions who was left in Mecca till Muqarramah. He didn't emigrate, even though all the other Muslims had emigrated. In fact, Abbas as well, radiallahu anhu, hadn't emigrated to Medina to Munawwara. And Fudayk said that, oh, Messenger, and this is a little bit Ibn Hibban, it's a Sahih hadith in, in the different narrations. He said, oh, Messenger of God, the, 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 the Muslims are saying to me, you are, you're destroyed because you're living amongst the disbelievers. And the Prophet said, Ya Fudayk, he said, establish the prayer, pay the zakat, 
uh, and leave aside a su, which is evil. You know, yourself pray, pray, give zakat, give charity. Leave aside things that are abominations and sins. Uh, and lay, stay wherever you want. And that is in the midst of people that are worshipping idols. Now, that was the Prophet I'm speaking at a time when he'd ordered people um, to do the hijrah. He'd ordered people to show their conviction to their faith by doing that. And Fudeg did not do that. And you also have the famous narration of uh, Salman al-Farisi uh, with Abu, Abu Darda radiallahu anhu. This is after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu And Abu Darda was, um, you know, he was, he'd, moved to, um, he'd moved to Jerusalem. And he sent a letter to Salman al-Farisi who was actually living in Basra. Had the Kufa al-Basra, I can't remember offhand. Uh, and he sent him a letter saying, come to Jerusalem, come to Quds, come to the third holiest site in the Muslim Ummah, this is the place of, of, of the congregation of the prophets. This is the place where the Prophet did the, the night journey. Um, and Salman al Faris is sitting in Iraq, which is, for all intent and purpose in Islamic history, always considered to be a place of fitna uh, in terms of, you know, the early period of Islamic history. He wrote back and, he's, and, and he said, Inna al-ard la tuqaddisu ahadan, which is actually a, f a fantastic um, statement and it, it just blows me away every time I think about it because he said, uh, al -ad la that the, 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 the land you live in, the land you live in does not make anybody more pious or somebody more sanctified than anybody else. The only thing that does that is the person's actions. So, as, as a Muslim, you could, you could do this hijrah, you could do this emigration to um, a Muslim country. And that will not elevate your status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think that will elevate your, your, your status as your actions. And that basically, it, it, you know, it really does change perceptions because that is what is important. You are in, the diff in a situation where it's probably more difficult to practice your faith. There's no adhan that you can hear usually. Uh, it's very difficult to keep, especially from our Muslim women, our sisters, it's very difficult to, to live in a, in, a, in a society which is, seems to be antagonistic, even though... It may be a perception, but at certain points it's not. It's very difficult, but the, the reward is increased and your actions are elevated and magnified and, and multiplied because of the difficulty in doing that. And that means that having an existence in this country is actually very important to have, a, have an intention to have a, 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 you know, an elongated existence and a complete existence here. So this issue of, of um, assimilating, again, is not, um, isn't, you don't have to dissolve your identity. In any country, in any society, that's never been the case. Um, when the British came to uh, the subcontinent, they brought you know, their own kind of um, cultural baggage as well. So a lot of that, like cricket, we have as well. So apart from Scotland, we're not, we're not very good at it because it's not, it's not a very good game. Uh, how should Muslims view the non-Muslim majority? I've just done that. Why is it permissible to live in the West? This is actually interesting. Um, why is it permissible to live in the West? This is actually a good question because there was a whole point I, I kind of touched upon before where Muslims had this perception that um, you know, to live in, in a, you know, live in the West, which classically they would classify as Dar al-Harb, which is the abode of, of war as in the classical nomenclature, um, is not permitted unless you are doing da'wah or jihad. And that was the kind of... I used to hear this a lot of times on, on members. People used to throw it in almost every speech they gave, which is all oh, Muslims of Bradford, all oh, Muslims of Manchester, and Manchester's a fantastic place, all uh, oh, Muslims of Leeds. You are here and you've, you've built your businesses, you're driving taxis, you're going to university, but, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not permit you to stay here. And this is not... This is for somebody's put this up and saying that I'm doing the khutbah, this is somebody that's, some, some, that's what I was hearing, you cannot stay here unless you do, you know, hijrah, you cannot do hijrah here unless you do da'wah or you fight. And I was thinking that sounds really strange, I mean, and that was obviously, there was a reason for that, and the mistake that was made in that, in that, that type of mindset is the fact that there was a complete misunderstanding of what uh, Dar al-Islam is, the concept of Dar al-Islam. A complete misunderstanding of what the concept of Dar al-Harb is. And based upon that, the basic binary perception of the world was Muslim countries, Dar al-Islam. That's not a problem. That's very easy to understand. And then everything else is Dar al-Harb. 
Now, why is that problematic? It's problematic because human history um, went through very specific stages. And Muslim scholars, in fact, you, don't, you have no content of Dar al-Harb and Dar al-Islam in, in the primary uh, Quranic text or the Hadith of the Prophet What you do have, in the sense that it's used amongst fuqaha, what you do have when scholars of fiqh, like Abu Hanifa or Imam Hassan al-Shaybani, or later on, you know, Asad ibn Aban, from the Hanafi school, or you know Al Baji from the Maliki school, when they started to articulate discussions about in Dar al Islam, Dar al Harb, they were writing us in, in, in at a time when the status quo for any group of people, any nation, was that they're they're at war with the other nation unless proven otherwise, and that's why in, the, in Arabic they always they used to say that if the, if you're not fighting the Byzantines, the Byzantines will be fighting you. In other words. You know, the, the borders of a nation state were not set. Basically, they were amoebic, they were growing. There was an or, it's almost like a, in geopolitics, have this idea of an organic state which grows and, and, and contracts based upon pressures from outside. That's what was happening. And Muslims all of a sudden said, if that's the case, then we are Dar al Islam. And it was we're the abode which is not a war with itself. And then every, everywhere else is Dar al Harb. In other words, we expect them to go to war, and you have to be ready for war. And that is the same for every single human nation at the time, up until, you know, you have the Kellogg um, declarations in the 1920s, you have the Geneva Convention on, on, on just war and, 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 and these kind of things, the, the actions you can do in war, and the fact that you, the nation states cannot fight each other, and the way that you settle disputes is through um, negotiations. Once you had nation states and, and the perception of, of nations and their ability to fight changed, then this idea of Dar al-Harb actually does not make any sense at all. And that's why this idea of the, the East and the West is not as relevant as it was in the past. And that's why those Muslim scholars or speakers, I don't know if they were scholars, um, when they said that you know you can't be here unless you do that while you're fighting, it was a complete misnomer, a complete misunderstanding of um, how Islamic law developed um, loading too much on specific terms and the end result of that was that you know we're here and we can't really um, we can't really invest in society here, we can't really feel part of society, we can't feel like stakeholders in society and that has in some way trickled down to the majority of Muslims for some reason this idea that you know a large segment of people of the population you know will have one eye in another place you know, I mean, myself as well. I mean, I'm my parents are from my father's from um, pre -part, pre partition India, and um, mother's from Pakistan. I've never been to Pakistan, but you still have this kind of idea that there's there's some kind of cultural, um, almost spiritual um, affinity to that place through language, for example, because I speak Gurdu and Punjabi. Um, but it does not detract from the fact that you also feel. That this, I mean, I'm from I'm from Glasgow. Every time I arrived back from the Middle East, I arrived back in 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 the train station in, in, or the bus station in, in Glasgow, it felt like I was at home. And when I arrived in Damascus, it felt like I was home. It depends on the, the amount you want to build into into your existence in a specific place, and that's what's the most important thing. Is it permissible to live in the West? Absolutely. In fact, the Prophet said that indeed this religion will will will. Um, will Enter into every single um, home made of made of made of skin or made of, of of stone from the east to the west, and 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 part of that is the fact that um, Islam has something to give. And I think what the big problem for Muslims is is they actually don't know what is it, what it is that Islam can give other people. They, I mean, that the, I, mean, I teach a lot, so I a lot of my time is not given, not taken up in lecture. I don't really lecture. But a lot of my time is given up in teaching classes, so I get to prize out discussions and perceptions of Muslims. You always think that Muslims, do they really understand their faith well enough to, to un un actually perceive what they can give society? And, and what is it that's new that religion brings in an essential sense to the British people? I think that discussion has not really taken place amongst the Muslims. And a lot of that is actually to do with the fact that they feel so intimidated by the, the general ambience of, of politics and society around them that they're actually finding it difficult to actually have that articulate that kind of discussion. So living in, in the West actually is a very um, interesting concept but I think 
um, you have to not engage with that question based upon the fact that you are here. The, the practical ramifications is that you are here and you have as much right to be here as anybody else. Because, you know, it's, it's, if you take a long term, you know, there's a program on TV, I don't know if you watch it, I've never watched it, but I know it exists, which is Who Do You Think You Are, which is basically about people who are the son of immigrants or daughters of immigrants. And you'll find that somewhere down the line, somebody's jumped onto this island. Some, you know, dinosaur jumped onto this island and, 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 and led to all these kind of things happening. And that's the same with every single culture. You know, my, my ancestors were not from India, Pakistan. They were from the Middle East. So people move, and that's a long way back. So people move and they assimilate and they make it their home and they contribute and, and take, you know, sometimes take a step back. Have a, you know, sit down with a nice um, cup of coffee and just think, you know, long term, we're in very difficult dire straits, but, you know, long term, we have no idea how long history works. And how long we have on Earth, and how long human civilization has on, on, on this Earth, we take this perception that there's periods of intense darkness in human in human uh, history, but also from that comes amazing um, growth and innovation, and not heretical innovation, and you know, kind of human innovation. We have to focus on the fact that that can happen, and also that we can be part and parcel of that. So our youngest minds, the young people that are listening, they should be invigorated to the point that they want to contribute and all the other things that, that hold them back they should see them as obstacles that will increase in, in, in actually focusing their intent and in actually doing something so that's the kind of some of the questions that are here um, so there was also a kind of comment from the from the um, from the chair he says that I um, I heard a, a European Muslim say that Muslims in the West should should, should more readily defend their host countries um, that their an than their ancestors, ancestors did. Do you agree with this notion? Actually, this is a very good question because actually, um, if I understand this right, because he's saying that somebody in Europe, a European Muslim said that Muslims in the West should do more or more readily defend their host countries than their ancestors did. And that is, well, that is a controversial one because of the fact that you'll get, you'll get cut down by everybody regardless of what you say. Um, so, I mean, if you cut to the chase, there's a very famous um, historical figure in terms of politics, a political analyst and theorist, um, Carl Schmitt, who, who came up, he, he wrote a book called, um, um, in English, the English translation is um, Political Theology. Uh, and he actually talks about this concept of politics really being, uh, once religion waned in, in the West, in religion, politics was a new realm of creating the heretic and the orthodox believer. So it wasn't based upon your on your religious belief, it was actually based upon your political affiliation. So you either had, um, the heretic in the past was a person who, you know, had strange belief systems. And nowadays, the, the fifth column is the one that goes against the mainstay of um, political opinion. So... Um, why is that important here? Because in the Muslim community, you do see tendencies to go towards extremes in terms of political affiliation, not religious affiliation, I'm talking about political affiliation, in terms of far left. Um, amongst the Muslim community is quite prominent. And within that, there's this kind of tendency that, you know, there's no, there's no mileage for, for, for being part and parcel of, you know, say, for example, the police here. Um, or even if you take it right to the extreme, you would go to, to say that the, arms are, the armed forces as well. And that's based upon very, very understandable, um, you know, understandable um, grounds because, you know, we have Abu Ghraib, where the American, um, the American nation specifically um, committed, you know, untold atro atrocities, um, not, which were systematic, which were um, institu institutionalized and which were part and parcel of the existence there. And that will haunt the, the American nation for the rest of its existence. Um, and, it, and it actually humiliated them in the international, um, on the international stage as well. Now, in terms of Britain, and, and this goes for every single country, in, including America, for example, there's two things. One is part of feeling ownership of, of, of your citizenship is, at the most extreme case, to put your life in the service of 
of defending the civil rights and the, and, the, and, the, and the freedoms, which are religious freedoms and also civil civic freedoms of other people. That right cannot be um, denied from Muslims just because they have grievances with specific instances that took place. So the only thing that makes logical sense is to say that we're complete pacifists and we do not engage in, 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 in conscription in the army, for example. Now, it's very difficult based upon Islamic sources to, to, to push this idea that you should be a pacifist. There is very strong grounds for pushing this idea that you should look for a complete banning of military hardware, of modern technology that, uses to, that is used to kill. And I personally think that the Muslims, one of the things that they should, they should be doing is really promoting this idea of, of banning the sale of weapons, all types of weapons. As a human um, project, we have, have, have gained nothing from the use of, of weaponry and we should start to investigate the, 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 the possibility of having that. Especially, you know, um, weaponry that kills indiscriminately should be um, completely, you know, haram. It's declared haram according to a lot of fatwas anyway. Um, but I think, apart from that, Muslims should still have the, the, the prerogative and, and the ability to actually jo join the armed services. And in a situation where they feel there's strong grounds for being a con conscientious objector to a specific action of the nation, they should um, use that right um, actively. Because at the end of the day, you're still a citizen of, of the country, even though you're in the armed forces, you still have the right to, to remonstrate against injustice, you all have the right to to demonstrate against the, the, the ill use of power by politicians um, and in fact the misuse of democracy by politicians. And we saw that perfectly in, in the example of the, of the, of the, the Gulf War. I, mean, I, I was here in the summer when there was a massive demonstration and I included, you know, I participated in that demonstration against the Gulf War. Um, you see that was democracy in action and all of a sudden a specific politician due to his own um, extremist reading of world, the world the world we live in decided to go to war. I think it's important to be part and parcel of that discussion, whether you're an MP, whether you are, you're, you're a councillor, whether you're part of the armed forces, whether you're a, pol you're, you're a police officer. You cannot have that discussion from outside. It's much more effective. And this is based upon just looking at the fact that it's much more effective. It's much more effective making change and effecting, effecting change within the structures themselves. And that means you have to be completely engaged in them to be able to, to point out the fact that this is not the values that we all share as human beings. That you do not wage war on innocent people, you do not, you do not, you do not create collateral damage to the point that you cannot justify the action in the first place. So I think Muslims have to you know, bite the bullet here in, 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 a, in an allegorical sense and say, okay, if we are willing to live here, we should also be willing to defend this country as well. And that goes without saying. The only question is, is there a perception that the, that the, that the military, um, you know, the whole military structure has been abused and mis misused by politicians? Um, and then that is a question of influencing from internally. And also, also it means that you have, you know, people like Amt International, you have pressure groups on the right side that actually um, take people to task as well. And they're important as well, obviously, in that situation. So I think, yes, I mean, initially when people did arrive in, 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 in Europe um, from the Middle East and from Turkey, for example, in, in Germany, they, you know, they didn't have this, this sense that they would fight. But the interesting irony about this whole discussion actually is, is that in the Second World War and during the First World War, you know, there was countless Muslims who died fighting for the British Raj, fighting for the, for, for the Empire. Uh, and that's a story that's yet to be told enough of. I mean, a lot of the, the host community, a lot of people that are British in terms of recent an ancestry, are not aware of the fact that you know a large large percentage of people that passed away and uh, fighting for for the British and for the, uh, the alliance and the allies were actually Muslims, whether it's from Algeria, whether it's from um, the subcontinent. Um, and so obviously that. You know, when you're saying that our, that our ancestors, our ancestors actually did sacrifice a lot, and in a sense beyond the call of duty as well, and and, and even more difficult situations, in situations where um, you were not permitted to speak up, you were not permitted to use your 
right as a conscientious objector to do that. But nowadays, you have complete statutory, statutory right and, in fact, responsibility to speak up uh, if you think that there's been abuse of, of um, procedural um, law in that specific situation. So these are some of the kind of general um, kind of questions that I got here. Um, so a lot of them are to do with, I mean, I've kind of touched upon this idea of, of politics. And in fact, I was, I was going to touch upon Carl Schmitt. And uh, Carl Schmitt, he, he, kind of, he had this book called Religious um, Theology, uh, Political Theology, sorry. But in that is also another interesting um, perception that he has, which is that politics is, is, uh, is, is the kind of, the end result of politics is actually the friend-enemy relationship. So you have antagonism within politics, which is very similar to the kind of antagonism that religions had one with the other in terms of this claim of truth. And the reality is that the end of that is war because, you know, one of the reasons that the Second World War took place was because of the fact that there was intense antagonism within the political arena for resources and for a social um, vision. And the reality is that that ended up with, you know, the death of, of, of millions of people. And the last century was, uh, you know, over 100 million people killed in wars that were to do with nation states um, vying with each other and not based on religion. And you probably know that, you know, one of the one of the reasons why, you know, the, the issue of violence and the issue of, of religious wars is so important is that there's a constant mantra in the public sphere about religions being inherently violent. And people who are religious are prone to violence more than people that are not um, religious. And obviously the statistics over human history completely destroy that concept. And so as, as, as a Muslim, you should perceive yourself as being a person that, that brokers for peace. You know, only 6% of wars in human history were based upon religious um, premises. Only 2% of people that were killed in, in wars in over human history were killed in wars that were ostensibly religious. And that means that as a religious person and as a person of, of, of God or a person of faith in this society, you should know that you are part and parcel of a faith that was instrumental in spreading peace and not spreading war in any country it went to. And, and that, the understanding of that actually means that your, 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 your ability to give this society something is based on the fact that you understand your faith to be one that spreads peace and not war. Um, and obviously, you know, when we talk about these things, we should be careful because Muslims generally are, you know, falling into this, this, this kind of, this, this rut of sloganism where they, they just throw out slogans and that's it. So obviously this topic, identity, people will say my identity is Muslim and I am a Muslim and that's the most important thing. But the obvious thing is there's different layers to a person's personality. I'm a male, I'm born in, born in uh, Scotland, live in Scotland, and my religious practice is that I'm a Muslim. My ethical uh, perception is that I uh, adhere to a specific theolo theological you know, understanding of faith. And I'm legally obliged to follow the, follow the law of Scotland, for example. So you have different, um, and they're not mutually exclusive. exclusive. My religious Scottish law does not force me to do something that is against my religious convictions or my ethical convictions. And so the, every single part is, is, is something that makes me my identity. And that's what we actually have to start to, to focus on. Because when I talked about Asabiya, and people always say, you know, you can't be part of any nation, you can't be part of the Scottish nation or the British nation, because it's Asabiya. Asabiya, as I remind you, is something that's divisive, which pu pushes back to a claim to inherent superiority of other, other people. Because remember the hadith of, of Asabiya, which the Prophet Islam, you know, he said one that calls to Asabiya or fights for it or kills for it is not from us. The context of that hadith actually was um, when the Aus and Khazraj were incited to fight each other um, because they were reminded of the, the, the Battle of Ba'ath that, that, ba that took place before the Prophet arrived, which was a tribal war between Aus and Khazraj. And they were, a person started to recite the poetry of the, of the battle and they started to remember the dead of each side. And because of that, they started to fight. And that was Asabiya. That is not the same as national identity. That's not the same as, you know, civic identity. Because at the end of the day, what makes us share in identity is actually shared values. And um, Imam al-Shatabi, rahmatullahi he says that all religious traditions and all human nations, and our nation specifically, I mean the Muslim nation, agrees 
that human civilization is based upon five basic principles, which are the protection of, of life, of religion, of intellect, of wealth, and of lineage. And he says, our community has absolute knowledge of that, but also other communities have knowledge of that as well. And if that's the basis of a society which you can build, then everybody can, can, can actually buy into that. And what you'll find is, you know, moderate voices on both sides of the divide will, will agree upon basic premises that um, actually are shared between people. Um, so I've been asked to um, open the floor. So the floor is obviously a metaphor, metaphor for the fact that there's people uh, in the air, not on the floor. You can open the, the air to questions and you can view the chat just under the video. You can text them to, to you. I can text them. So can you text them because I can't actually see anything. I'll let's have a look if I can actually see a text possible. So yeah, any kind of questions, any, any, um, any, anything at all. Let's see what's happening here. So I'm not very good at this. So obviously, um, so obviously, um, it's it's a very difficult question. You can you can get incriminated incriminated by whatever you see in these kind of discussions. So. Um, but it's good to have a kind of a kind of open discussion. This this discussion has been quite an open thing about just general thoughts about this uh, um, topic uh, and, and whatever um, you know is interesting about it. And it's very it's very topical because identity from one extreme, one puritanical understanding of identity would obviously be that your identity is to the Islamic faith and to the application of Islamic law, and that means. A khilafa, and obviously that's one of our big issues in our community is that our perceptions of what a, a Muslim state of being would be is that we can only equate it with a theoretical construct and, and Muhammad Abu Zahra was a very famous scholar, Egyptian scholar who, who, who passed me in the last century he, was, he, was, he actually wrote a paper on on identity and khilafa and he said basically that concept of khilafa was was an was an abstract which was a reality for the first early generations of the Muslim community, but the moment that Muslims um, started to go outside the Arab hinterland, it was impossible to have that kind of unified um, state of being. So there's a couple of questions here. Um, actually, this just came up now. Um, okay, so okay. Um, the future of Muslims seems uncertain. It's reminiscent of the Jews in early Nazi Germany. How do we understand our place in the West? It's a very good question because you can draw parallels and I think if you can draw parallels, you can also learn from mistakes. I think one of the mistakes of the, um, or the perceived mistakes of the Jewish community at the time was it was, seen, it was seen to be external or um, ghettoized in specific enclaves. But there was a lot of interaction between the Jewish community and, and the rest of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the host nations as well, to the point that they were ancient communities. So the Jewish nations were, or the Jewish peoples in the West were actually you know, discriminated against for a long period of time, so it's slightly different from our, our situation. It's very easy to draw the parallels, but I think we need to be much more engaging. And, you know, Unless you give, people will be suspicious of your reasons to exist. I mean, I was speaking to somebody, uh, a doctor who said a, a patient came in, he talked about, just in, 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 in the consultation, they talked about Donald Trump and the fact that then it came out, the Muslim, he said he thought the Muslims were practicing taqiyya, which is a very strange thing because, you know, the person who's being to re very barely knew what this meant. Taqiyya is obviously to dissimulate and to pretend you're saying something that you're not or to lie or to be two-faced. And so this kind of perception, unless you engage, and he said after speaking to the person over 20 minutes, the person understood that wasn't the case. But it was, the reason for this misunderstanding was the fact there was no interaction. And we can't just go to the worst case scenario, which is, okay, extermination in Nazi Germany. Um, but there is kind of parallels. I mean, Germany was very cultured. I mean, they were listening to Bach, Beethoven, reading Goethe, and, you know, so they had a very heightened cultural heritage, I mean, far greater than Europe, Britain. I mean, it, is, it's, it goes without saying that their music and their, and, their, and their poetry was far richer than, than anything that France or, or, or Britain's produced, but it still led to this, um, this crazy 
um, situation. And that's why you have to always give. I think what you have to do is be become a group of people that give. And, and the difference here is that I think we have a lot to give um, society and we have to start to invest in the cultures and the countries and, and the cities that we live in and, and start to invest our time and our energies in building projects that are grassroots and, and shared between different religious traditions as well. I mean, I'm a great believer in, in interfaith action, not in interfaith dialogue. I think dialogue just ends up being dialogue and it doesn't give any kind of um, output. I think Muslims should engage in interfaith activity so that they, you know, they, they're seen to be people that are actually giving based upon shared values. They're not just cared, they're not only concerned about their own country and their own uh, countries back home or their own kind of community, but they're actually they're concerned about wider society. And, and, and remember, last year during the floods, uh, you know, there was all these stories about Muslims helping out and going, and, and the amount of uh, heartfelt thanks that was that was expressed by the host community. For Muslims coming from other cities like Leeds or Bradford to their own, you know, small towns and hamlets, was that these people are actually people that give, and they, this is basic concept of the Muslim characters that, that it gives and I've, I've always seen that that trumps any, you know I don't want to use that word but it always trumps any negativity that exists, even the most antagonistic of people will be moved by that and remember that goes back to the fact the Prophet, when I mentioned this at the beginning when the Prophet arrived in Medina Munawwara he actually entered into a city which was actually antagonistic to him and he changed it over you know, very difficult Process. You had the hypocrites there constantly agitating the Prophet. Them, you know the the Bani Ghatafan and the Quraysh constantly coming to fight. You know the Jewish tribes constantly being undermined and and being almost like um, ransomed to actually you know you know go for, stand against the Prophet. Them. All these things, the Prophet fought fought them with his character and with his teachings. And in the, at the end of the day, he ended up creating a city, which Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu said that. The day the Prophet entered the city of Medina was the most enlightened day that the city saw, and the day the Prophet passed it was the most was the darkest day that the city ever saw. That was because he changed the situation, which was so difficult, and he changed it into this most the, the most uh, optimistic of all cities, Medina Munawwara. And we should always have this this um, sense that if the Prophet could do this in that city, the teaching. And the take-home message for us is that that is the transformation that we need to bring to any context that we live in. And we should not think that that is difficult for God. وَمَا ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِعَزِيزِ The Qur'an says this is not difficult for God. So never think that something is difficult for God. Our task is actually to invest. It's to, it's to fight the, the rampant Islamophobia that exists within certain sections of the press. And it's not something that I, I think personally is shared by a lot of people, but it's, it's propagated... And it, it and it catches people's uh, attention, and they and they subscribe to it at a distance, but it's e easily rep repulsed. And that's why that that question of Nazi Germany is important because Nazi Germany was a very very small niche of niche and gr small group of people that were at the core of the Nazi um, project, but it got you know twenty twenty five percent of active involvement by other people. And those people just disappeared as soon as they felt that it wasn't in their best interest. That's the same thing you have you have you have you have in America as well. We have a small you know band of people that are ideologically driven, who have then got the ear of twenty to twenty five percent of the American population that vote a person elected. They can they will easily jettison that person, and they will easily be people that will, um, then see the validity of you know having a much more inclusive. American vision for society and that's the reality of the situation but we can also as Muslims fall into that same trap you'll have a very small minority of Muslims that will that will consider the, the path of violence and uh, you know the path of excommunication of other Muslims and the path of, of of actually secluding yourself from society to be the path and depending on the situation you might find Muslims you know 20-25% of Muslims gravitating towards those people um, and they'll gravitate away from them. And what we have to very clearly do is not allow these extremes, whether it's within the Muslim uh, community or within the, the host community, non-Muslim community, to actually set down the agenda for how we interact um, as people. So the important thing is building civilization. You have to feel part of society. You have to feel, feel a stakeholder in society. 
And as soon as you feel that, then inshallah, that is the thing that will allow you to to really put your mind to 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 the question: What can I do? Um, invest in terms of investing in this society to make this a place for myself to call home, but also for my family, my extended family, my friends, to be a place that we can we can create something that is that is an, that that is a testimony to God sending um, human beings on earth as khalifas. At the end of the day, that is our our task. In the Khalifa, Quran says we're, we're going to send upon the earth a vicegerent. And when we die, I mean, that's our. We want to die having fulfilled as much as we can that quality of vicegerency. And if we do that, that success, that is the very thing that we want to go into our graves with, is that we meet God having attempted within difficult context that we're in. And we're in Britain. We're not as difficult a context as lots of the places I've, I've, I've stayed in. We should we should count our blessings, and that, that this kind of discussion is to a large degree um, peeled into peels into insignificance when we look at other parts of the Muslim world. So thank you for hosting me on this very strange platform, which is Facebook um, Live, which um, obviously I will never get used to. But um, I was just stopping my my child, a couple of my kids coming in here trying to hijack the session. But any, anyway. Jazakallah khair for listening and inshallah we will meet um, very soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.